activities in terms of qualification and position. The target of these activities, however, is always the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As confirmed in Bhagavad Gita, he is the Supreme Enjoyer. So whether one is a Brahmana or a Shudra, one has to satisfy the Supreme Lord by one's activities. This is also confirmed in Srimad Bhagavatam by a verse which reads, Everyone must be engaged in his particular duty, but the perfection of such work should be tested by how far the Lord is satisfied with such activities. The injunction herein is that one has to act according to his position, and by such activities one must either satisfy the Supreme Personality or else fall down in one's position. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 so a reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 7, Text 15. The chapter is entitled, What Prahlad Learned in the Womb. Rishya, Rishya Karunikas, Karunikas Tashyaha, Tashyaha Pradad, Ubayam, Ubayam Ishraha, Ishraha Tamasya, Tatvam, Gyanam, Cha, Mam, Api, Udishya, Nimalam, Rishi Karuni Kastasya, Rishi Karuni Kastasya, Nadadu Bayam Ishraha, Nadadu Bayam Ishraha. Damasya tatvam gyanam cha. Damasya tatvam gyanam cha. Mamma pudisya nimalam. Mamma pudisya nimalam. Rishi karuni kastasya. Rishi karuni kastasya. Radha dubayam ishvara. Radha dubayam ishvara. Damasya tatvam gyanam cha. Mamma Pudisha Nimalam, Mamma Pudisha Nimalam, Rishi Karuni Kastasya, Rishi Karuni Kastasya, Radha Dubayam Ishvara, Radha Dubayam Ishvara, Damasya Tatvam Gyanam Cha, Damasya Tatvam Gyanam Cha, Mamma Pudisha Nimalam, Rishi Karuni Kastasya, Radha Dubayam Ishvara, Damasya Tattvam Yanam Cha, Damasya Tattvam Yanam Cha, Mamapi Udisha Nirmalam, Mamapi Udisha Nirmalam, Rishi Karuni Kastasya, Radha Dubaya Mishara, Radha Dubaya Mishara, Radha Dubaya Mishara, Rishi Karuni Kastasya, Radha Dubaya Mishra, Dhanasya Tattam Gyanam Cha, Mahapindishya Nirmalam, Rishiya, the great sage Nardamuni, Karuni Gaha, naturally very affectionate or merciful to the fallen souls. Kasyaha, to her. Prada, gave instructions. Ubayam, both. 
of Ishvalaha, a powerful controller who can do whatever he likes, Narada Muni. Dharmasya, of religion. Tattvam, the truth. Jnanam, knowledge. Cha, and Mum, me. Api, especially. Udisha, indicate things. Nimalam, without material contamination. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Ki. Nada Muni delivered his instructions both to me, who was within the womb, and to my mother, who was engaged in rendering him service. Because he is naturally extremely kind to the fallen soul, being in a transcendental position, he gave instructions on religion and transcendental knowledge. These instructions were free from all material contamination. Please repeat after me. Narada Muni delivered instructions both to me, who was within the womb, and to my mother, who was engaged in rendering him service. Because he is naturally extremely kind to the fallen souls, being in a transcendental position, he gave instructions on religion and transcendental knowledge. These instructions were free from all material contamination. Purport. Here it is said, Dhammasya Tattvam Gyanam Cha Nimalam. The word Nimalam refers to spotless Dharma, spotless religion, or in other words, Bhagavat Dharma. Ordinary ritualistic activities constitute contaminated religion by which one benefits by developing material wealth and prosperity. But uncontaminated, pure religion consists of understanding one's relationship with God and acting accordingly, thus fulfilling the highest mission of life and returning home back to Godhead. Prahlad Maharaj advised that one elevate oneself to the standard of Bhagavat Dharma from the very beginning of life. Kumara Acharet Pragno Dharman Bhagavatam Ihat. The Lord Himself also speaks of pure, uncontaminated religion when He says, Savadaman Parichaja Mamikam Sharanam Vaja. Abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. Bhagavad Gita 1866. One must understand one's relationship with God and then act accordingly. This is Bhagavad Dharma. Bhagavad Dharma means Bhakti Yoga. Vasudev Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Priyojitaha Jnana Chatyusu Vairagyam Jnanam Chayad Ahoytukam. By rendering devotional service unto the personality of Godhead Sri Krishna, one immediately acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. Srimad Bhagavatam 127. To be situated on the platform of pure religion, one should perform bhakti yoga in relationship with Krishna Vasudev. Omagyan Timurandasya Yananjana Shalakaya Chakshu Un Militanyena Tasma Shi Pihaya Shri Chaitanya Manovistan Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dati Swabhita He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jakapate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Vata Kanta Nishe Pancha Kalpa to Udisha Krita Sindhu the Evacha Patitanam Pavaryo Vaishnavate Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichinanda Shri Kreta Gadadhara Shiva Sati Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama So repeating the verse one more time. Narada Muni delivered his instructions both to me, who was within the womb, and to my mother, who was engaged in rendering service. Because he is naturally extremely kind to the fallen souls, being in a transcendental position, 
He gave instructions on religion and transcendental knowledge. These instructions were free from all material contamination. Namun Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Prasad Bhutale, Shumati Nishivarama Swami Nityananda. So for those who are not familiar with this book, um, it's called Shrimad Bhagavatam. It comes in 12 cantos or volumes. Um, so this is the second canto. So the, the 12, the full Shrimad Bhagavatam is like a big set like this. Um, it's part of um, a group of Vedic literature called the Puranas, which are like history books. Um, but they go back very far in time, like tens of thousands of years, hundred thousand years. Um, these were written down in the ancient Sanskrit language of India about 5,000 years ago. So, so already they're very ancient, they're like 5,000 years old. Um, but the, the oral knowledge, where it, traditionally it was an oral knowledge that was passed on orally and people would remember the knowledge and then they'd pass it on to their students and it went like that for many, many thousands of years prior to that. So it's considered very authoritative because of its ancientness. So a lot of the pastimes in here and the philosophy of Shura Bhagavatam, um, modern science differs with it because modern science has changed and has speculated and have come up with their own idea of like evolution so they, they say that evolution is a more of a, a recent thing, that more recently in the past some thousands of years, we've evolved from monkeys and now we're humans. But the Vedic scriptures um, defy that because this knowledge goes back many, many thousand years, even a hundred thousand years. And there it said that um, life was very civilized, that human beings are actually more advanced then, than they are now. So in this modern science, they portray that this is the most advanced we've ever been. Look at all our technology. But actually, it's not. When we go back to this um, ancient culture, they were flying through the cosmos to different planets on these chariots, and they could, they could guide the chariot just by thinking. They could put their hands on pads, and they'd think left, and the chariot would go left. They could think up, the chariot would go up. So they had great powers and they could use the powers of the mind to, to move vehicles and do many other wonderful things. So where are we in this pastime? Because these are part of the Puranas, which are like um, stories, but these stories are to help elevate our consciousness. So this story that we're reading now in this seventh uh, canto, it's, it's entitled What Prahlad Learned in the Womb. So when we read these stories as well, they, they're quite kind of funky. They're a bit out there, like compared to stories we hear in this modern day, when we read these Bhagavatam stories, it's like, really, that was going on at that time? So I'll just give you a little overview so you can get a grasp of the story, where we're at with it. <laughs> so um, many thousands of years ago, there was this terrible demon it, like, like today, we have like good and bad, you know, like Lord of the Rings, the middle planetary system, and higher and low planetary systems. But it's very similar. A lot of the Lord of the Rings seems to have like been drawn from this Vedic knowledge in, in its understanding. So there's always this duality on this middle realm, you know, always light and dark, good and bad, masculine, but, you know, so, so that's always been there. So like we have your president, Joe Biden, and I don't know what you think of him as your representative. But personally, I think you could probably do a better job. You know, um, I think a lot of people could because this age is an age of call and hypocrisy. That's, and that's what we see with the leaders. They want power and control, but um, they're fighting, you know, the bombing Israel, fighting Palestine, genocide and Russia and Ukraine. We see it constantly. There's been no peace practically since World War I and before. And we want peace, you know, people want peace so we can progress nicely in life, but the government leaders should be setting the example, but they're not because they're not qualified to take that position. So also in this age, there was a terrible demon, his name is Hirani Kashipu, and he was also um, very powerful, but, you know, he was corrupt and he went to control and rule the people in a, in a bad way. So it's, a, it's the same old story. He went off to perform terrible austerities to get power. He wanted actually to become immortal. So he left his kingdom. He went to, um, to 
could form or stage it like meditate fast in this hill. And he wanted to attract Lord Brahma, the creator of this universe, to give him this benediction of um, immortality. So while he was gone, the demigods or like beings in higher planetary systems, they, um, at this time, there was a lot of interaction between different planetary systems. It says in the Bhagavad Gita that there's life on every planet. It's not just planet Earth, that every planet has, has life. And in the past, there was a lot more interaction between the beings from the higher planets. They could come to here to, and, and interact with um, people on Earth. So these demigods, because they're more pious and righteous, they, um, they saw an opportunity to try and seize the kingdom on Earth to help bring peace when Harani Kashipu was away. So they came, invaded the Earth in a good way, and raided the palace. All the demons in the palace started fleeing for their lives because demigods were quite powerful. And at that time, Hirani Kashipu, the demon leader, his wife was there in the palace and she was pregnant. So um, they assumed, well, this child in the womb is also going to be a demon. So what they, they did, they decided it was a good idea to kidnap her and take her to their heavenly planet and wait for her to give birth. And once she gives birth, then they're going to kill the baby. That was their plan. So this is a story, this is what's going on, this is like what we, what we read, what enlightens us. So the demigods came down, they kidnapped the wife, started taking her through space to their planet. And when they were doing that, there's this great personality called Nada Muni that we just read about. They, they call him a transcendental spaceman because he has the ability to move through all the planetary systems where we generally don't, but he doesn't even need a chariot. He can just kind of float around and move. Um, so while the demigods are going, Narada Muni came past through space, saw what was going on, and stopped the demigods saying, what are you doing? They said, we're taking this. Because she's screaming, ah, help me. He's like, you can't do this to this lady. Drag her away from her palace. And they're like, yeah, but she's the wife of Rani Kashipu, and she's, gonna, she's pregnant. She's going to give birth to this demon. So um, he, he corrected them because Narada Muni, because he was a great mystic, he had insight of past, present, and future. So a lot of these mystics can do that. They can see into the future and, and know what's going to be unfolding. So he said to her, to the demigod, sorry, that actually you, there's not a demon in the womb. There's a pure devotee. There's a pure devotee in that womb and um, you can't take her and kill. So what I suggest is you leave her in my care and I'll take her to my ashram, which is like his hermitage. And I'll look after her until her Nikashipu comes back from his austerities. So that's what happened. Now, when she went to the ashram and she was with Nard, um, Narada Muni, Narada Muni enlightened her with what's called transcendental knowledge. So he taught her because he was a great teacher of this, this knowledge, what they call Bhagavad Dharma or Bhakti Yoga, devotional yoga. So he was teaching her this knowledge and enlightening her. At that time, Pallad, the little boy, was in the womb and he could hear. Because we're not this body, but we're pure spirit soul, he was fully conscious even in the womb and he could hear the teachings and he became enlightened in the womb by Nath Muni's teachings. So then she went back to the palace, gave, gave birth to Pallad, this, who became this pure devotee. Meanwhile, Harani Kashipu, his dad, was on that hill performing the austerities. Um, and he said he performed such austerities like meditating and fasting that all his um, flesh withered away. And his life was just kept in his, in his like, bones. His life airs was just in his bones. He, he, he had nothing left. And um, ants, if you go to some countries, I don't know if it's like that in America or France, but I mean, I've seen it in Africa on television. You can get these big ant hills that come very tall. And he'd been there for a long time and ants had built this ant hill around him. So he had this big ant hill coming up and he's there performing these austerities. And it says that he had fire coming from him that was burning up the heavens. And the demigods went to Lord Brahma, who's considered, who's the creator of this material universe, who was empowered by Krishna with creative powers. They went to Lord Brahma and said, you have to do something about this Hanurani Kashipu. He's like burning up the whole creation. So Brahma went down to see him and said, you know, what's going on? And he's like, I want a benediction from you. And Lord Brahma's like, well, what do you want? He says, I want immortality. 
And Lord Brahma lives on the highest uh, planet in this material universe. But Lord Brahma said, e I can't give you that because even I don't have immortality. He said, I, I might live for hundreds and thousands and millions of years, but still I have an end. So I don't have more immortality, so I can't give it to you. So then Hiranyakashipu starts um, asking for different benedictions then. Okay, well, give me the benediction that I can't be killed in daytime or nighttime. So Lord Brahma's like, okay. Give me the benediction, I can't be killed um, by a human or by an animal. Give me the benediction that I can't be killed in the air or on the ground. And like, okay, so he kept asking all these benedictions and when he, he received them all, he thought, I've done it, I've tricked them. I can't be killed now because I've got all these benedictions that mean essentially I am immortal. So he went back to his kingdom very happy and um Pallad was growing up and um a young boy he was at school and this is where we're up to now in this um, story so he was at school with his uh class friends but it's a, it's like a a school of Hiranyakashipu's kingdom so they just taught politics and diplomacy how to control others, how to manipulate, you know, it's one of those type of education systems. It wasn't how to share and love and be a better person. So he was in one of those, you might call a private school kind of, and he was getting that kind of um, teaching, but because he was already self-realized, he wasn't taken by it. He wasn't fooled by those teachings. He had higher knowledge. So whenever the teachers went out the classroom, he would start preaching to, kind of preaching, you know, sharing this knowledge to his uh, friends, his children friends who were like seven, and enlightening them <clears throat> and getting them to sing and chant. Because this Hare Krishna mantra, it says it, it's actually an eternal mantra. Sometimes people ask, oh, when did it first, when did people start chanting this mantra? But like, it's hard to perceive of eternity because we're limited by our mind. We only understand like this temporary nature. So to perceive like no beginning and no end, it's quite a hard concept to grasp, but because of Krishna's eternal nature, and ultimately they say we are also, our, our eternal soul is also, it's eternal, like our pure consciousness, who we are. Um, jai Shishi Kodanatai Maipo Sashi Ki Shishi Kalsina Ki Shishi Kididari Lao Ki so yeah, so the mantra is also of this eternal nature. So he was singing, the school teachers um, would come in and they caught him like doing this to the children. So they went to his father, you know, because Pallad would come um, home and his father would be like, oh, so what have you learned today? And Pallad would be like, I learned, um, you know, Vishnu is all wonderful and um, to engage in devotional service is the highest activity for mankind. Naran Kashipu pushed him off his lap. He said, what are you talking about? You're no son of mine. Where did you learn all this? And he brought the teachers in and he, they said, has someone been coming into the classroom, like climbing over the wall and teaching the children this knowledge? And the teachers were like, no, we don't know where Pallad has got this knowledge from. So, um, so here, in this particular verse now, we've got to this point where Pallad has been teaching the children. Um, we're going to just get a little bit more philosophical now. So Pallad was teaching the children um, this knowledge. Now, was Pallad making this knowledge up? You know, is, is he just like, so what he's showing here in this verse He's explaining what happened that Narada Muni delivered these instructions both to me, who was in the room, and to my mother. So now he's showing that, no, I had this teacher, Narada Muni. And this is, the, this is the process of this Bhakti Yoga that it comes from a lineage. Uh, it's not knowledge that's made up, it's ancient knowledge. And often in this Vedic culture, when you speak this culture, people um, want to know, like especially in India, they might be like, oh, who's your guru? Who's your teacher? Because they want to know who, what's your lineage, where's your lineage from, where's it go? And we have a very beautiful lineage, actually. I mean, Srila Prabhupada, he's the most prominent personality in our lineage because 
He was the person who brought this knowledge to the Western world in the 1960s. So before that, this knowledge, what we call a Vedic culture, um, it was non-existent in, in the West, just like yoga really was non-existent before the 1960s and vegetarianism and meditate, you know, they weren't, it was the gurus brought them from India in the 1960s. There was a great movement from East to West. So at that time, Srila Prabhupada also came to the West, um, but he was came to teach what's called Bhakti Yoga. It's the yoga, it's devotional yoga. Because um, often when we hear of yoga, we think of the physical postures, like that's what yoga is, that's what most people think. Like yoga is like well known now all around the world, but still most people think it's physical postures. But actually there's many branches of yoga, like there's jnana yoga, which is a yoga of knowledge. So people are very scholarly, they study all the scripts, and they become like jnana yogis. There's karma yoga, which is like the yoga of action. So people that like engage in service, you know, people who really like to help others and engage in selfless service. This is like karma yoga. Then there's a hatha yoga, it's known as ashtanga yoga, the eight limbed yoga, which is the physical postures on one part of that. And then we have this bhakti yoga, which is the devotional yoga. So when many of the gurus came to the West teaching uh, the physical yoga, Srila Prabhupada also came, but he came to teach devotional yoga, and that's what these centers are. And what his mission was, he had a guru. Um, this is the lineage that you see these personalities on the altar. So the second one on the left there, that's Srila Prabhupada's guru, Bhakti Siddhanta. Then the one next to him is Gautha Shaw. That's Babaji, it's his guru, and it goes all the way back for many hundreds and thousands of years. So we've got this like, unbroken lineage, lineage, and every personality is extremely pure and powerful in their own right. And what makes them powerful is their purity. It says, what is a pure devotee? A pure devotee is someone who is free from material desires, ultimately, you know, and that's very rare to find a personality who's free from material desires. Most people we desire um, things of the world to, to make us happy, but a, a pure devotee is atmarama, it means they're self-satisfied, they, they have no desire, their only desire is to help others. So Prabhupada, his guru Maharaj, said to him, he said, you're a very well-educated person, you speak English, you should take this knowledge to the Western world and um, share this knowledge with the people because um, they need it in the West. So he was only a young man at the time and he was married, he had business, so he was thinking, how can I do this? How can I fulfill this instruction of my scripture master? But he meditated on it all his life that he wanted to. Finally, in later years, there's a culture in the four orders, the ashrams where a person can enter into the renounced order. Once the children have grown up, once they've gone through family life, then they become what's called a sannyasi and they renounce the world, even renounce their family and they take the just, um, spreading the message, traveling and spreading um, the message. So he entered into the Sanyas Ashram and he was 69 years old and before he came to the West. It wasn't until he was 69. And he was coming to try and transplant an ancient Vedic culture into the modern Western world. So it was a very difficult thing to try and do, you know, transplant an ancient Vedic culture into the modern Western world. But that was his mission. And he came with practically no money, just a few Indian rupees a little box of cereal, a few books that he'd already written and translated, and he came on a cargo ship from India, from Calcutta, so he was the only passenger. And on that trip, um, he actually had a um, heart attack, and he was really suffering. He prayed to Krishna, if it's your will, save me and let me reach the web where I can share this knowledge. And he said, in this dream, Krishna appeared in his dream and started massaging his heart. And he, he woke up and he felt much better. And then the, the, the ocean became very calm for the rest of the crossing. And the captain um, said that it was the calmest he'd ever experienced on this ocean crossing from Calcutta to um, Boston. Uh, yeah, Boston, New York is where he arrived. And um, this was in 1965. And then in 1960, by 1966, he'd found himself in downtown New York. And it's where all the hippies were. At first, he was up in to it. They'd, they'd kind of associate with him and think he's an interesting personality, but they weren't willing to give their lives to like the mission, you know. So he ended up in downtown New York, and um, there's a park there called Tompkins Square Gardens, and he's he sat in that park.
and um, started singing with him. A lot of them were on drugs, whether it's LSD was quite popular at the time, or, or ganja or whatever. But they bought musical instruments and they were singing. And, and that's how he started his, his movement. And then they got a little shop front for him and he started teaching in the shop front. He had a good place to live. And that became like the first temple. Like here we're in Kaluna Baban, Krishna Eco Farm. So this is in Scotland. Um, and it's very beautiful. It's quite opulent and it's very lovely. You have nice land and there's room for development. You know, plan to get cows that we're going to send you a photo of when <laughs> we get the cow. And, uh, you know, there's lots of room for development. Obviously, more people here would help with the development. Um, but it's a beautiful setup, but it started very humbly, just in this little storefront in the 1960s in downtown New York. And some of his disciples went to San Francisco. They set up a second one. It's a bit south of where you live, isn't it, San Francisco? A little bit south. So they set up a second one in, in San Francisco. And from there, then he sent some disciples to the West here, to London. They set up some temples and that, and then it's just spread all over the world. And Prabhupada traveled the world 14 times in 12 years so he wasn't around for long he was only around for 12 years but in that time he traveled about 14 times and he opened 108 temples and farm communities from nothing so in a way it's quite miraculous and what's unique about it is that he came to teach um what they said here unadulterated um devotional service so like um pure bhakti because like we were speaking in the canteen last night, that a lot of um, religion, it's materialistically motivated and we're talking about how it's fear-based as well. So um, this is transcendental, it, it, it's, it's very pure and it's very attractive, but many people can't take to it fully, the process, because we've, diverted so far from who we really are, from our essential nature. We, we've diverted so far that now when this like pure lifestyle comes, which they say it's actually, this is like normal living. This is our nature of the soul is to serve. That's what we're here to, to do is to serve. But in this materialistic society that we've been brought up in, the, um, the movement How can we enjoy and find our happiness separate from connection with the source or the divine or as we know Krishna um, and that's a, a big problem because ultimately there's no real happiness to be found in that way it's very temporary like we have so many material desires and we need to fulfill those desires so we have to go out we have to work to make money to fulfill them because often these material desires need money to be fulfilled and then we get some temporary satisfaction from that activity. This one, and it's constant. But actually, there's no happiness there. It's actually suffering. It's like, but it, it, there's just temporary relief from suffering every time you snort that line of coke there's a temporary relief every time you smoke that split or drink that vodka you know you get a temporary relief but then after some time you need another line you need another of it you know and, and it's constant and that's that's the, a person's reality there's nothing beyond that so to come to this like pure life is um is a very challenging situation but pro party with his mercy he came to give us um, like a, a pure life that we can connect with the divine. Um, and especially by chanting this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, um, which I'm sure you know very well by now. <laughs> um, this is, this is, and that's why I say it's very simple because it says that everything's contained in the mantra, that it's like in a seed form, that when you have a, an acorn, the whole oak tree is contained in that acorn. So likewise, in the Maha Mantra, Krishna and all his attributes, all his beauty, his love, um, his knowledge, it's all contained in there. And when we chant, it says, um, 
Chaita Dhapana Nadjanam, Dhabhamahadhadhin Vapanam, that it's a, it's a cleansing effect on our heart. When we chant this mantra, it cleans our heart um, from contamination or misunderstanding of who we really are, like our true identity is pure consciousness. So we clean the heart, it's, a, it's, like a, um, it's like a mirror, but the mirror's got dust on, and by chanting this mantra, it's cleaning the dust off that heart. So then we can see our true reflection, and we, ah, this is who I am. Um, this is called Sambandha in Sanskrit. And then when we understand that Sambandha, it's like, well, what do I do now? I realize my, my identity, my true nature. And um, then we act in what's called Abhidaya. Then we, 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 we act in that position of understanding. So our lifestyle will change. So that's a, a big difference. Material life, it's about trying to satisfy our senses. Um, Bhagavad Dharma, or this back to yoga, is, is trying to satisfy the senses of the divine. And by doing that, we'll naturally become happy. So we don't have to endeavor for happiness. Happiness comes as a natural consequence of being engaged in service, you know. And, and, and it's a simple point, but it's so profound. Just that little adjustment from trying to, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to go to a nightclub tonight because I want to enjoy tonight. I'm going to do this now. And we're always trying to, what can I do to make me happy? But that conception never works. You change that conception, connect to the source, the divine, let me be in service. Now I'm happy, you know, and we notice that when we were engaged in service. Like I've seen you like yourself when you've been in, in service here. Like when I first came and I saw you, you seemed so happy because you're like, I'm cleaning this now and doing that. And it's like, wow, she's really happy in her service. And that's that's how happiness is found. It is through service, it's through service to others not service to ourselves. Okay, so um, we're nearly coming to an end. We've got a few minutes left, so I'll stop there. Um, if anyone's got any questions, comments, or corrections. Yes, Prabhu. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, uh, to explain the question, in addition to the second of the mantra, because I listened to Vishwan that I've said today, uh, from my and in this week, I said the story about this friend. Who is not a Eastern devotee, and in his ashram, they got their different deities, they got the Buddha. <laughs> and, um, and they had a 24 hour kirtan and they chant on the Mahamantra. So he asked his guru why we chant the Mahamantra here, we have Buddha, we have this, 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 this. And his guru said, why not? You know, this Mahamantra contains all mantras in this world. Mm -hmm. So that's the addition. And my question is, uh, uh, so you said about the you said about the different uh, yogas. Mm. So what actually uh, what yoga mean? Mm. Uh, what yoga what this means? And uh, um, if the yoga is it yoga religious process? And you put that piece of wood over each of their neck to bring them together. That's a yoke and it brings union. So, so yoga, that union can um, be either union between mind, body and soul. So it's like that union with yourself. And when we have that union with mind, body and soul, then we have harmony within ourselves. So this is one aspect of, of yoga or union, because often um, people can have disharmony in himself, like we want to do one thing, but there's another voice in us wanting us to do something else. So we have this inner conflict. So there's no union, there's no yoga there, there's inner conflict. There might be like one, oh, well, I should do that, and another part is, well, do that instead, and you don't want to, but you're finding yourself hard not to. So there's this inner conflict. So union where, where everything's cleared out, all that conflict gets cleared out, and then everything works in union with each other. So whatever the mind thinks, the higher self, or the soul is in agreement and then the body acts on that so there's beautiful harmony and it's a very lovely experience if we ever get to experience that union within ourselves and harmony it's it brings a lot of peace and they say peace is the foundation for happiness we can't truly be happy unless we first find peace because the happiness will only be temporary because the um the lack of peace will disturb the happiness so first we find peace and that creates a foundation then happiness can actually spring uh, from that peace. And, but that doesn't necessarily um, mean it's, it's religious, you know, like some of the yoga process isn't necessarily religious, 
um, as such, like the Astanga yoga process. But ultimately, as we follow that process further, even the Astanga process, um, one starts to have union with the divine. So it says in the Vedic scriptures that we have our individual soul or Atma, and then we have the supreme soul of Paramatma. And they say they dwell together in the heart region. And the Paramatma is like the witness to our activities. Because when we speak about karma, how can we understand that karma? Because the witness is in everyone's heart, seeing our activities. So nothing is ever hidden, you know? So then when, we, when a yogi is going within and, and connecting to the divine within their heart, then that's a religious experience, even though it may be spiritual. When we talk about religion, religion is a, like a recognition of the divine or God. So it's religious, but it's probably more spiritual. And then back to yoga, this is, this is religious activity, but ultimately it's on the transcendental platform. So it, it's, it's ultimately spiritual. So, so if we follow the, if we follow, uh, let's say, uh, or we go back to yoga, I would say, we're going to be, we're going to be, say, say, no. Um, and this is what this verse is actually talking about, like mundane religiosity, dharma, artha, karma, moksha, this, this process, because um, it's materialistic, it can take you to like a heavenly planet, you know, because it's within this realm of materialism still. So you can, you can go to heaven, but when we understand like Vedic cosmology, we understand that there's a covering to this material universe and beyond this material universe are those it's unmotivated it's, it's a highest destination that can take you beyond this material world of repeated birth and death and back to the, the five hundred planets okay thank you Thank you. Any anything else? Or we'll stop there then. So much.